live at the Covenant Place, Igomu, Lagos. Our next speaker is Bismarck Rewani. Bismarck Rewani is the Managing Director, Chief Executive of Financial Derivatives Company in Lagos. He has more than 40 years of experience in the financial services industry as an economist, banker, and financial analyst. He's an associate of the Institute of Bankers of England and Wales and a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Bankers. Mr. Irwani has served on the board of several organizations, including NLNG, Prize Award Foundation, Unique Insurance PLC, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, UBA, Custodian Limited, to mention um, just a few. Mr. Bismarck was recently announced as a member of the newly formed Economic Advisory Council of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Please join me with a warm applause as we welcome Mr. Bismarck Primari. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> The theme of today's discussion is redesigning the Nigerian economy with new ideas. So as I drove here this morning, I also listened to the Chinese president as he celebrated his 70 years of the Communist Party. And on this day in 1949, Mao Zedong did say that workers of the world should unite and he strived for a greater China. And 70 years later, Jinping, the president of China, said, no force can shake the status of this great nation. 70 years of the Communist Party, and he used the phrase of McFadden and Whitehead, ain't no stopping us now. We are on the move. Now, I also reflected on the theme of this discussion today, redesigning the Nigerian economy with new ideas. That presumes that the problem with Nigeria is that there was no, the design is flawed, and the economy needs new ideas. I think that theme could be considered to be flawed in the sense that Nigeria has had a lot of ideas. Nigeria has had a lot of plans. The Nigerian economy exists, and we all know the problem. So there's conference fatigue, there's discussion fatigue. What people want now are results and impact. So <clears throat> let's go to the fundamentals. And let me start with some quotes. Milton Friedman said that one of the greatest mistakes is to judge policies by their intentions rather than their results. And Rudy Dombush said, crisis takes longer to arrive than you can possibly imagine. But when they come, they, they happen faster than you can possibly imagine. And Friedman also said, if you put the US government in charge of the Sahara Desert, in five years, there'll be a shortage of sand. So, again, like I started off by saying that Nigeria has had plans. It is the execution of the plans that is the problem. And we know the problem. So if I if you are told to come here today to listen to the Nigerian problems, you would stay at your homes. The reality is that how and what can we do to change this, not the narrative, uh, you hear that, but the outcomes. Now, the word design means that a plan or something created often in the art, fashion, buildings, constructions and all of that, the word design means that you have options available. You have 
four distinct options. One, no design. Two, bad design. Three, good design with poor execution. And four, good design with effective execution. So where, when you talk about design, it starts more from the architect's point of view. And so I looked at Joseph Strauss and Charles Ellie, who constructed the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. The design was in 1921. The construction started in 1933, and it ended in 1937. The Golden Gate Bridge, as you know, is in San Francisco, very close to Silicon Valley. Uh, Professor Gupta just talked about it. Palo Alto, where Stanford University is, is responsible for about 7 to 8% of the global GDP today. Is, there, is it by coincidence that the great design of the Golden Great Bridge, where people used intellectual depth to design greatness, also happens to be the place where today, many years later, Steve Jobs, Zuckerberg, and everybody comes around in that Silicon Valley area. So there is, this, these things could be coincidental, but at the same time, there's a relationship that exists between intellectual depth, intellectual honesty, and outcomes. I think we need to have that in mind. And when Strauss finished, of course he died, he said, at least the mighty task is done. Resplendent in the western sun, the bridge looms mountains high. Its titan piers grip ocean floor. Its great steel arms link shore with shore. Its towers pierce the sky. And that's how he celebrated the Golden Great Bridge, the suspension bridge in California. That's to talk about designs. Now, another form of design superiority is in the world of fashion. Of course, you know, in the last Forbes list that was published about last year, the second richest man in the world is no longer Bill Gates after Bezos. The second richest man in the world is the chief executive of Louis Vuitton, which is the world of fashion. And um, he's worth about $124 billion in a world of the world of inequality. And some quotes from the fashion world, because fashion is about design, merchandising, and then the, 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 the uh, sale of these products to a world full of vanity and all of that. But Coco Chanel said, in order to, re, 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 to, in order to be re, irreplaceable, one must always be different. Fashion fades, but style is eternal, right? And of course, Coco Chanel also went further to say that, and I'll quote in a minute, um, to say that style, fashion is, like, fashion is um, available, but style is eternal. I've said that already. Now, having said that, Let's go back to the core issue of today, which is, is it the new ideas that Nigeria needs? Or is it the execution of those ideas? Or is it the implementation of the old ideas which have not been done that is a problem? So having said that, we go immediately to, and I looked at, the fact that 20 years ago, the five tallest buildings in the world, five tallest buildings in the world because of architectural design and resources were in the United States. Three of them were in the city of Chicago, Sears Tower, Johnny Hancock Building, and the Standard Oil Building of Indiana in Chicago. Now, O'Hare Airport was the busiest airport in the world. This was 20 years ago. Today, of the 10 tallest buildings in the world, 
Only one of them is in the United States. Only one of them is in the United States. Is it by coincidence that the design and the growth rate of the economies where these buildings and structures are are also the fastest growing? Of course. There's the United Arab Emirates, which 20, 30 years ago was nothing. And now you have the tallest building there, the Burj Khalifa, with 2,717 feet high. The next tallest building is the Shanghai Tower in China. And I just talked about celebrating 70 years of the Communist Revolution. The next after that is Macau Royal Tower in Saudi Arabia. And after that is Ping An Finance Center in China. And the fifth is Golden Finance Center. So of the five tallest buildings in the world today, three are in China. 30 years ago, the Chinese plan China was going at 7%, 8% a year. Today, they have an economy which is about $13 trillion. And they're saying that nobody can stop us anymore. Was it because of new ideas? Or was it because of the mental discipline to execute? So we're not short of ideas. The ideas are there, the plans are there. 15 years ago, I met Professor Joe Stiglitz in the company of Professor Chukuma Soludo sitting down here. That was the first time I met Professor Soludo. And Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, shared some of his thoughts. Those thoughts were in Lagos here. So if it was ideas, if it was thoughts, we shouldn't be where we are today. The mental discipline is more important than the fiscal discipline. The discipline to be honest and to say the truth. The discipline to stay the course is more important than the new ideas. So I, I do not agree with the theme that redesigning the Nigerian economy with new ideas is what is required. Because ideas come, but they have to be, they have to be executed by people. The how, the impact on the ordinary lives of people is more important than just theorizing. We have the summit group every year. We go to Abuja and starting again next week. <laughs> Quite frankly, I stopped attending because there's summit and conference fatigue. And Einstein, said, Einstein had a way of describing this, that if you continue doing the same thing and you expect different results, then there is an institution meant for such people. So now, one other thing that is important is that in 1960, our GDP was $4.1 billion. In 1960, the GDP of South Korea was $3.9 billion. Today, it's $1.5 trillion in South Korea, and we are at $400 billion. Not because of anything else, but because of the discipline of pursuing what your economic philosophy is. I think that's very important. But another thing is that the thought process that goes into conceptualizing a plan, executing a plan, getting the feedback, and ensuring that you stay on course to achieve your goals is also extremely important. The Nigerian economy today, the things outside our control are more than the things within our control. We cannot determine the price of oil. We cannot determine the equilibrium, global balance of demand and supply of oil. We have no control over the commodities. So after oil, you have LNG. After LNG, you have sesame seed and cocoa. And all. We have no control. So the things that you have control over are the things that are internal to you and domestic. The things that you have control over are your own policies and to see the impact of your policies. 
The things that you have control over is the contract between, the social contract between the rulership and the followership. The things that you have control over is the credibility of your leadership and the credibility of the followership. And when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about political leadership. I'm talking about corporate, political, social, unions, trade unions, elites, traditional rulers. Because when the institutions for conflict resolution have broken down, the alternative to what you have in orderly society is anarchy. And so today, as we speak, as we fear about kidnap and ransom, as we fear about income inequality, as we fear about growth, as we fear about economic insecurity, we forget the fundamental issue that that social contract between the rulers and the ruled is important. That, and that credibility comes because of not what we say, because we talk is cheap, but what we do. I think that's important. So, so the extent, and we look at our economic performance over the years, over the past 40 years, 59 years, something comes clearly to me. That is that the exogenous shocks, the exogenous variables, the cross-border risks are becoming more profound, in fact, more dominant whilst the domestic variables are becoming recessive in gen you know, genetics, we talk about that. Now, let us take examples. In 1974, when the price of oil quadrupled, this economy had what we call a positive shock. We had an oil blessing, which turned out to be not so much of a blessing after all. We have seen consistently that anytime things change outside, the more integrated our economy is with the rest of the world, the more vulnerable we are. And this vulnerability has increased because of two things. One, we have not learned from the lessons of the past. And two, we've exposed ourselves to those vulnerabilities by not actually implementing plans that will insulate us from those shocks. So I, I want to differ with the fact that this economy needs new ideas. This economy needs new plans. I want to differ that what this economy needs is a mental discipline to learn from the lessons of the past and to use those lessons to chart the way for the future. We had the oil shock of 74. We had the downturn, we had the downturn thereafter. We had global shocks. We were here in 2008 when the economy took that sharp downturn. Global crisis, financial, market, economic crisis, everything, what, what they call one in a hundred year. And what happened? We saw ourselves completely devastated. Stock market tumbled and all that. Now the question is, did we learn any lessons from that? Did we learn lessons from the Southeastern crisis of 1995, which did not affect us directly? Did we learn lessons from 2008, so that when there was another commodity shock that came in 2014, 15, were we prepared, were we insulated? No. So if you don't learn the lessons from the past, then, like Satanaya said, you are bound to repeat those mistakes again. So, again, we closed our borders four weeks ago, and today the price of rice is 25,000 naira a bag, 20,000 naira a bag. Why? It was 15,000 naira a bag only five weeks ago. Was there an earthquake? No. <laughs> Did the population of Nigeria multiply by two in these four weeks? I'm not sure about that, right? So what happened? Does that show you the vulnerability to even simple border closure? We talk about hard Brexit and the hard border 
in Ireland. I'm talking about closing the semi border, closing the, the borders here, and the price of turkey has gone up by 45%. The price of rice. People said we cannot find, what was I being told yesterday that there was shortage of milk or shortage of some things. Why? Because the border got closed? How vulnerable can you be to exogenous shocks from Benin Republic, population of 11 million people? Why are we vulnerable? because we refuse to learn from the lessons of the past and lessons of others. Lessons of others. In the eastern part of Nigeria, there's a saying that says that when your neighbor's beard is on fire, you put your own in a bucket of water. Why must you wait for it to happen to you? I think these are critical lessons. Now, what to do next? First and foremost, let's simplify it. I don't like to make things complicated. I, Farid Zakaria says that, first of all, three steps. Stop doing the dumb things. Stop doing dumb things. Then start doing smart things. Then finally, start doing modern things. Modernize those smart things. So the question is, every day you open the newspapers, and I ask you, and, the, the followership is more important than the leadership in this respect. Because everybody sits down and complains. The next time you are appointed to some board or economic council or something, you go there and you get married to the natives very quickly. Right? And then you start saying, oh, you know, making excuses for the inexcusable. No. So, Professor Chukuma Soludo is here, I'm here. One thing you can, you're not going to, cannot buy intellectual honesty, you have to, it's there. People are fiercely independent and they will say what they like. If you don't like it, too bad, right? So the truth is what is required now. The truth is what is required and you will get the truth. So what are those, nobody's gonna make excuses for things that are, things that cannot be, you know, uh, you know, the, the, no difference between, if you watch a movie called Scarface, there's no difference between an excuse and a reason. The same thing, right? So um, people are not interested in reasons for failure. People are interested in reason how to celebrate success. And that's what it's all about. So take the newspaper every day, and you, if you read that this road has been opened or that road has been closed, you take it whether it's a, if, if it's a dumb thing, you take it as dumb. If you see all of a sudden that the Enugu Airport has been closed or opened, and therefore you can now go by road to Owerri or something, but the road from Onisha to Owerri is so bad that you cannot get there. Dumb thing, right? Okay. <laughs> very, very simple exercise. Every morning, take the newspapers and put three columns. Dumb, modern, smart. So if, if, when you add it up, if there are 10 items you take in the newspaper that day, if seven of them are dumb, two of them are smart, and one of them is modern, then that day you mark it down as that day of a failure, right? If the next day you now hear that you pick up the newspaper and you see six, smart thi six dumb things have stopped, three smart things have been done, and one modern thing has been done, you mark it success. At the end of the week, mental exercise, seven days in the week, we saw that of these seven days, three were good days, two were dumb days, and one was a modern day. Then you can say, okay, this week, next week we'll look forward to the outcomes of this dumb week, smart week, or modern week. That's the way to look at it. So that if you do this exercise, when the election is coming, When the election comes and you have your PVC, which is your marking script, and you've had 
this course every week. Dumb week, <laughs> smart week, modern week. And the dumb is more than the smart then? No. If the smart are more than the dumb, yes. And that's the way. That's where the, the, the leadership is in the followership. The leadership is in the followership. So, again, I go back to the theme, redesigning the Nigerian economy with new ideas. Sorry, the ideas are there, they've been there. The plans are there, they have been there. The economy is where it was, it's gotten worse, it, could, it, it will get better, but slowly, with work. Slowly with work, but with honesty and proper articulation of the thoughts. With mental discipline, which is more rigorous than fiscal discipline. The easiest thing to do is not to decide how much not to spend or how much to spend. But the most difficult thing to do is to accept that you are not as rich as you thought you were, one. And the worst position to be called is to be saying that you are a former rich man. <laughs> Some of us know what that's about. A former rich man status is a very difficult status to accept. So I'm hoping that 12 months from today, we'll come here and say we're former poor men. Or we'll say that, again, we've lost that opportunity of having a mental discipline. Or let us say and accept the truth that we are exogenously exposed. Let us accept the truth that we are not competitive at this time. And Professor Gupta has raised a number of issues here. To be competitive, you have to embrace technology, you have to embrace the digital world. But more than anything else, those things are meaningless if you don't have the mental discipline to execute and the mental discipline to accept the truth and say the truth so that the impact can be felt by the ordinary people because people are tired and exhausted of being told one thing and seeing something else. Like in Nigeria, what you see... Thank you. What you see is what you see. What you feel is different. And what you hear, what the ideal situation is that what you see, what you feel, and what you hear should be the same thing. And if they are distinct, if they are far apart, then you have a problem of credibility. And that credibility gap has to be bridged. So we are hoping and the word hope has no place in strategy. We are hoping and praying that because of the confidence, the fact that there, will be sincere, there should be sincerity, I'm using the word, should be sincerity. Because Nigeria has come this far, failure is no longer an option. Failure is not an option. Success is imperative, but success cannot be wished. Success is a product of hard work. And remember what I said at the beginning, stop doing dumb things. Start doing smart things. And then stop, start doing modern things. Remember you bring out your newspaper every day or your internet and mark every day how many dumb things you see, how many smart things you see, and how many modern things you do. Thank you very much.